forum. Let's go ahead and begin recording. All right, I'd like to call to order today the uh, Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force. This is a joint meeting between the Behavioral Health and Legal Justice Systems Committees. We welcome you all here today and a special welcome to our presenters that are with us today. As we begin and as our custom all the time, we're gonna start with a, with a, um, a land acknowledgement statement. Before we begin, we acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Lummi, Nooksack, Samish, and Semiyamu people who cared for and tended this land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We pay respect to their elders, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us here together today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. I would add just one piece to this as well. From a personal standpoint, one of the reasons for me why it's important to read statements like this is for what we do with that knowledge going forward. So I look forward to reconciliation, to working collaboratively to make our community a better and safer place. So that would be just my, my personal addition to our statement. So with that, um, we are going, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Mike Parker. I'm co-chair along with Dan Hamill of the Behavioral Health Subcommittee. We're joined also by Raylene King and Arlene Felder, co-chairs of the Legal and Justice Committees. And with that, I wanna thank you all for being here today and getting to my agenda. Um, with that, I'd like to welcome our first presenter, uh, Tori Sandoz. Um, Tori, I have your title as Program Coordinator and also faculty at Whatcom Community College in the Substance Use Disorder Professional Program. We welcome you here today and we're really excited to hear what you have to share with us. Awesome, thanks Mike, is this, my, is this when I jump in? This is exactly, this is your time. My time, perfect, okay. Um, well, thank you all for inviting me to come and talk with your committee. I see some familiar faces. Um, it's nice to see you again coming out of uh, pandemic um, isolation. And um, I want to sort of share my screen a little bit. Um, what, what I'm planning on doing is share with you a little bit about what we're doing up at Wacom Community College um, to sort of contribute to the solution uh, in our area. And uh, again, thank you, Dan, for for uh, inviting me in. I, I met Dan in his living room on Zoom. It was great um, doing another thing. So Zoom has got some wonderful uh, 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 capacity, you know, for for linking people together. Oh, let's see here. I'm going to see if I can't share my screen. And if it gives me sass, then I'll let you know. And you all should be able to see that here. Yep. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to squeeze you out of the way so I can see a little bit better. Um, so Whatcom Community College um, has a substance use disorder professional program where we are training uh, drug and alcohol counselors um, in our area. We have three different programs. One is a certificate program, which is designed for, for folks who are um, uh, already have a degree. Uh, and then we have an associate degree program. And then we have the alternative training program for mental health counselors who already have master's degree and are currently licensed with a behavioral health license. Um, so my goal here is um, to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I know I only have about 10 minutes, um, but I just want to say a couple things about the place where I'm coming from. I've, I've been working in uh, the drug and alcohol field in some capacity or another since 1988. I got my career started here in Whatcom County back before we had certificate programs, and we were all just qualified uh, by the state of Washington to be able to help people struggling with substance use disorders. And those were the Wild West days. Um, uh, a lot of us didn't, uh, a lot of us have retired and moved on now, but a lot there are quite a few of us left, and, and uh, I'm really grateful 
example for how the state of Washington has sort of helped sort of corral what exactly this means. Um, we have been fighting for a long time to legitimize the substance use disorder profession um, as, a, as, a, as a profession as opposed to a paraprofession. And, and so some of the things I'm going to be talking about really helps distinguish the difference between the SUDPs and the peer professionals. Um, but for context, um, I, I kind of want to share, just remind everybody a little bit about what substance use disorders are. And I like to do this as I go into these um, presentations to sort of, help you know, where I'm coming from, uh, talk about the SUDPs, uh, their role in our, in our uh, community and the training they have to go through, and then a little bit about our, our program and some really fun up and coming things that I think are really exciting. Uh, I also want to say, you know, if you guys have any questions, you can just like interrupt me, right? I, I can't see your hand, so, um, and I can't see the chat very well, and so I'm, I'm totally fine with uh, asking me questions. Um, all right, my, my uh, orientation to how we approach this work is that substance use disorders are really the disease of more. It lives in the limbic system or the center part of the brain. Um, and folks who suffer from this condition, their brains have been hijacked. Um, what happens is, is that the, uh, the messaging system between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system where the nucleus accumbens lives is, uh, has been disrupted. And my dogs, of course, have chosen to go barking. Hopefully you don't hear them. Um, so when the stop switch is, is really disrupted, um, the person who um, has engaged in substance use uh, really can't stop unless they are removed from the, um, uh, the drug, either via incarceration or they run out or some sort of institutional um, uh, event like hospitalization. Um, opiates really uh, wreck the stop switch um, faster than just about any of the other substances we have out there. Uh, it just really tears up the brain. Um, so I talk a little bit more about the go switch, which is um, the, 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 the pleasure reward pathway. Um, and it's basically an overactive survival messaging saying, whatever you're doing, it's working, keep doing it. Um, we were going to remember that whatever you're doing is going, to, um, is, is going to work. So make sure you go back and do that some more. And then um, uh, do whatever you got to do to be satisfied that so that we can survive. And for our people, I call them our people, um, this means avoiding withdrawal, avoiding uh, pain, avoiding uh, guilt and shame, and a whole bunch of, a whole variety of these things. This is also the very same uh, messaging system that works for folks who are struggling with chronic pain, um, who are struggling with trauma. Uh, this is very active uh, within that. Um, within those uh, events as well. And so uh, it's a pretty powerful, um, it's a pretty powerful pathway. Uh, these, the, the, the prefrontal cortex is the area of logic, which says, hey, I really ought to quit using because I'm on probation, I'm gonna have a hot UA and, and all of that. Uh, that. That piece doesn't engage first. Um, the, the survival mechanism engages first. And so it takes a long time for folks to develop new ha new habits and new memories uh, to sort of replace those survival pathways. And so that requires a lot of um, outreach, a lot of intervention, and a lot of uh, support in a variety of ways. So that's sort of where we come from um, uh, at Whatcom Community College. And, and uh, I've really come to sort of see this because this is the particular model that, um, that sort of in in incorporates everybody. If you're human, this thing can happen to you. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. Doesn't matter um, how much trauma you have um, endured um, or not endured. It, it, you know, people who come from really healthy families uh, with lots of positive upbringing. This can happen to them as well. Okay, another view. I love these. Um, uh, slides. I plucked this off the internet. Um, uh, many of you may have heard of Dr. Daniel Amen, who sort of pioneered spec scanning. And he started his work uh, with 
um, folks who were struggling with attention deficit disorders. And so um, spec scanning is essentially a, uh, a nuclear imaging um, uh, type of testing where it shows in the brain where the blood flow is and the activity in the blood flow in the brain and, and in other organs if you've ever had a spec scan. But so what you're seeing here is a slide of a person who um, uh, is living with opiate dependence uh, for at least seven years. And you have a comparison between the two brains. And so this, this you're looking at the top down from here. And so you're looking at the uh, the, the activity within the neocortex, which of course is, you know, where all this logic, the logic centers live, where all of the executive functioning lives, where all the decision making, um, you know, cognition lives. And you can see that it appears to be a lot of inactivity in this particular brain. Um, the brain doesn't literally have holes in it like switch like Swiss cheese. It just shows how our people really struggle with making decisions and problem solving. This is the slide I like to go back to time and again to remind me that when I'm asking um, uh, my my clients or patients to do this service and that service and the other service and to get off and on several buses in order to make that happen and they don't make it happen. Um, without some practice and support, this is the brain that they're that they they are dealing with in order to try to make those connections. Um, you know, we we know that the brain can uh, has has the capacity to heal in a lot of ways, um, and so a lot of that uh, uh, takes a lot of nutrition and a lot of uh, environmental uh, support and intervention, um, and not using um, someone. Um, I, I've also seen um, other spec scans looking similar to this for folks who were using uh, methadone as an opiate replacement. Um, and so while I uh, methadone is life saving, it is certainly um, going to still require a lot of support for folks. Um, but on the other hand, for people who are really struggling with um, fentanyl and fentanyl analogs in our in our community, I am being told by reports of talking to a lot of providers across the state that uh, methadone helps people stay engaged in treatment um, at a higher rate than folks who are just using other medication assisted treatments. So um, really that's our like our our big arsenal. All right, I know I'm preaching to the choir. So on to what we do. Substance use disorder professionals are are like the only non-master's level trained person who are legally able to diagnose and assess a, um, a behavioral health disorder. So in this in this instance, it's a substance use disorder. So we are highly, highly specialized. Um, we do things like, you know, assessments, treatment planning, referral. Uh, we do a lot of community education and family education. Um, individual and group counseling with folks who are struggling with so substance use disorders, uh, relapse prevention, lots of case management, and then I tell my students, be prepared to do a lot of documentation. So um, in, Washing in Washington and in Whatcom County, this is sort of what we're looking at in terms of job availability and what the kinds of wages that are being offered by um, our uh, clinics out there. Um, we expect our, our our uh, profession to grow rapidly and um, there's always a uh, uh, folks who are always reaching out to me at Wacom Community College saying hey we've got positions open do you have anybody who can um, fill these positions and you know agencies are literally coming to us saying I'll train your students we like to at Wacom Community College we like to get our students through most of the education piece and not send them in too soon because I don't want to burn them out too soon and that is always a concern um, because it takes a long time to train people and retain them um, as opposed to uh, looking for more people and then um, training them and then onboarding them and all of that. Um, so our, you know, the wage range for the trainee starts at about 19.50 an hour, and then folks who are fully uh, licensed um, are 23 to 25 dollars an hour more or more, depending on their education level. And then there's kind of a uh, a recruitment role uh, where they're offering um, a variety of uh, uh, hiring bonuses. So, did hey, I hear Tori? a question? Yeah. yeah, I've got one for you. This is Jackie Mitchell. How are you hey, doing Jackie. today? Hey, Jackie. Um, I was just wondering, have, have you had a chance to check how those wages compare to the rest of Washington State? 
Um, yes, there it, on this particular website um, on ONET, it sort of shows that across the board. So to, in some parts of the state, uh, it's actually lower. And in some parts of the states, like in King County, um, it's a little higher. I think King County is like one of King and Pierce County are offering pretty high wages. Um, I think largely in part to some of the um, uh, municipal um, rules around minimum wage and then having to push wages higher. Yeah, that makes sense. It, it's about what you would expect then. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if I could, I want to double down on Jackie's question. This particular aspect of, of behavioral health workforce has been the subject of several of our meetings. and so much so that um, that our committee has actually drafted a letter to the county exec really really kind of doubling down that this is an area of workforce and workforce pay and retention yeah. in your opinion does that 23 to 25 an hour is that enough to get the entrance that we need into this industry to to get a sufficient capacity of folks or in your mind would would some other amount and, and what would that be um if, if it would need to be hired to drive more um, that's a really, really good question. And um, I've worked as a hiring manager in the past. Um, and and you, there's, a, there's several things that are happening with this particular wage range. One is um, uh, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of training to be able to work with people who have such high needs that we have. Um, and the entrant, you know, the, the training that we have is, is um, takes a lot. Um, on the other hand, we have we also have folks who are entering the workforce with master's level degrees who don't get this particular wage, um, you know, who just have a behavioral health um, uh, license and they're earning less. I don't. I wish. I wish I was a. I wish I was better versed in um, how wages are are um, are calculated um, but my experience is is that whenever um, when I, what I tell our students is, is to put everything on your resume every volunteer position every customer service thing you ever did anything having to do with you know taking some type of a uh, an interview or an intake in any kind of position is going to go into the cake mix and sort of be able to develop some type of a an offer in our area um, is it enough to keep people? People who come into this field, Mike, um, come into it for the field more so than they come into it for the wage. And so there's um, there's some competition with that as well. It's like, what will the market bear? Yeah, thank you so much for covering that. I know it's kind of a loaded question, but I think we understand it's a process to kind of answer that and, and to look at those things you, you attested, right? You don't want to burn them out too fast. We're also really keenly interested in what what are the aspects of employment that that stave off burnout that help people feel nurtured and continue to do this for long periods of time oh i, I could talk another hour about we'll do that, that in another i want to derail <laughs> you but thank you for at least touching yeah. on it because it's an area of really yeah. big interest for them it's, for the it's really not the wages it is the uh conditions under which drug and alcohol counselors are working um and how quickly they have to turn stuff around um for other things like um you know the the managed care organizations courtney I, I see your hands up hey yeah hi i'm a behavioral health specialist with the whatcom county public defenders um i see we're recording and i'm working from home so i would like my living room to not be on youtube um but i just wanted to chime in and and say that um as someone who's who's um always looking at those wages as a master's level uh provider it, it it absolutely is the wage we we need both we we need more supportive work environments but the wage has to be higher um we we, we see a lot of this happening in these conversations where service providers are it's assumed that we enter the work for the heart and that is true but we also have bills to pay and so i would just like us all to keep that in mind as we're talking about service provider burnout agreed uh dan then arlene yeah i just wanted to chime in here real quick um i i agree with what courtney just just said the the problem with 23 to 25 dollars per hour is that it doesn't um the ho housing in whatcom county especially in bellingham is so expensive and to to meet basic needs and to even be able to save a little bit 
it, it really does need to be more of like 30 to $35 per hour. Um, and in, in my opinion, um, the, the work is so challenging that that, that pay should be uh, commensurate with, with the, um, the type of work. And my question for you, Tori, is um, how, like, who are the providers in Whatcom County that uh, de are de like are um, dependable when it comes to providing these types of services? Is it Lake Whatcom Treatment? Is it the hospital? Are, are there others that are are doing this? Like, who's who are providing services uh, in Whatcom? Yeah, yeah. Um, I know Doctor Dr. Cartman was providing services for opiate. Um, mm -hmm. um, addiction. So I just wanted to get a sense of who the providers are out there and um, and how well they're doing. Um, the, we have a we have a pretty good list of providers in uh, the Whatcom County area um, doing a variety of services at different levels of care, which are driven by the ASAM criteria. Um, Dr. Cartman provides medication assisted treatment services, um, intervention services up at the hospital area um in in their emergency room um, we have our local outpatient um, providers um, both uh, nonprofit and for-profit um, places like catholic community services lifeline um, some of the for-profit um, folks like bridges and um, oh, lake Wacom center does uh, uh does some residential services um, for co-occurring um, and then Lifeline has uh, another uh, low-level residential place that they struggled to bring online. It took them months to be able to bring that online because of a, a worker, worker shortage. Um, not only are we dealing with uh, worker shortages, we are dealing with adequate, adequate supervisor shortages and, and, and being able to provide um, uh, the necessary training for supervise to be qualified supervisors for SUDPs. And so that's an area I, th I think it's low hanging fruit. That one is like, how can we get more training into the community to help train people to be supervisors to supervise up and coming uh, drug and alcohol counselors. Um, the other thing I want to say too, and you guys probably all already know this, but many of the agencies, um, their budgets are really determined by their funding streams, having especially with the managed care organizations. And if they don't reimburse, um, it's going to be really harder to um, bring up uh, wages for um, their staff. And so that's kind of a big piece of that. Arlene. Uh, you're still muted, I believe. Uh, in regard to salary, uh, it's true that uh, the managed care networks are going to fight it. And I can only say that um, uh, these kinds of decisions usually respond to uh, pressure in various ways. Uh, if the uh, healthcare authority uh, is supporting, you're nodding your head, uh, is supporting an issue, then uh, they'll move. They will move. But in my opinion, uh, $35 an hour would be at the very least an appropriate salary for uh, uh, a certified uh, professional. But in addition, I really believe, and um, I come from the counseling end of this uh, field and worked in crisis stabilization with both mental health and SUD at the same time. What I saw is that most people do have co-occurring disorders. Yeah. And that means that the, um, the SUDP uh, staff need some background in counseling just as the counselors need background in SUD. And so uh, as a, a person who trains counselors, I urge the new counselors to get their SUD uh, certificates also, even though it's lots of extra work and so forth, but we need that knowledge to be cross-trained. It's absolutely mm -hmm. essential because of uh, how frequently it, it occurs. You need to have that knowledge. Oh, absolutely. Um, I love teaching counseling skills and group facilitation skills. Uh, and then the pandemic, I taught folks how to do it in a telehealth 
uh, manner. And that was pretty exciting. So, um, yeah. Uh, Jackie, was it you first or Raylene? I, I lost count. It's me. Raylene's behind me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I totally agree with you, Tori, about supervision. I think it's the kind of the missing link that often gets overlooked because each supervisor supports what four or five clinicians and so yeah. you got to ramp that piece of it up as well and um, I don't know that the agencies are really doing that I think they're having a hard time harder time with that than than uh, hiring you know counselors and then also people really want to ramp up the peer support part but that requires even more supervision so yeah. you know you just have to have those supervisors on board and then Dan uh, we have a list as well of SUD agencies that I'll send to Jill and and she can send that out to the rest of you. We just updated it here recently. It's also on our website. We have both mental health and SUD agency listings on our website. Oh Thanks. yeah. Um, in in the old days, Jackie, remember the Green Book? Yeah. It still absolutely. lives. Um, online. It, as online for, uh, with the healthcare authorities. So if you entered uh, healthcare Washington State Healthcare Authority Green Book, it will pull up a PDF of all of behavior health, licensed behavior health agencies in the state of Washington um, for both drug and alcohol and also mental health. So if, if you have an afternoon you want to just peruse, that's a really good place to kind of see who's where, you know, around. For sure. Thank you, Tori. Yep. Uh, oh, also, I just wanted to add, uh, really appreciate uh, your framework around SUD and, and the process in the brain. It was uh, easy to understand and well articulated. Thank you. Oh, nice. Thank you. Raylene. Thank you, Tori, for this presentation. I really appreciate it. It's been very enlightening. And um, I've got a couple questions. Jill, if we don't need the slideshow, maybe we could take that part down so we could see the full screen at this point. Um, now on yeah, to sure. Tori, Tori, do you want to stop your share? I think, Tori, if I'm not mistaken, you're on slide six out of 11. And I'm wondering, does it make sense to continue on? We've got, you can see you're sparking a lot of questions. Um, what makes the most sense for you as the presenter? Do you want to finish through and then do questions at the end? Or are you okay with this iterative um, process? Let, let me let me hit a couple more slides. I really okay. want people to have a visual on what people what yeah. counselors have to do in order to become a counselor and the course and then a little bit about the coursework we have and then my little surprise thing at the end. I'm kind of excited about it. So Perfect. um Courtney, so, it, it, oh go ahead, Marlene. Sorry, I, I do have a couple other questions. One um is about is there a possibility that would help bring more into this industry or to stay in Washington if there was education incentives, um, scholarships to complete and to stay in Washington? I, would, I mean, it's a nationwide shortage of healthcare providers. Um, not that I don't care about the other states, but I really want to help the people that are here. Um, so yeah. that's one question. The other is, a lot of times when we're talking about dual diagnosis, um, domestic violence is definitely an issue. Is there ever any specialty training that you do so that you can have counselors um, treating both the opiate disorders as well as domestic violence treatment? Uh, excellent questions. Uh, to answer question number one, I think that uh, agencies and, and students, particularly students, will tell me that they have to work full time somewhere else to pay the rent. They can't just go to school on, on um, financial aid. The, the piece that is really difficult is when we send our students into our internships, those, those are those internships um, take, you know, anywhere from 12 to 20 hours a week to complete, which really cuts into their time to be able to earn a living. If those could be supported through some type of a, uh, those internships can be supported through some kind of a grant um, so that students can pay their bills and do this in, and do internships, that would be phenomenal. Some agencies will, will um, hire people like almost before the end of the internship but the internship is really sort of like a, a long job interview for a lot of our agencies so that's one thing that I, I just I really wish that could be one thing that we can do and then the second piece is um, I don't have anything specific that we're doing with regard to uh, interpersonal violence and 
substance use disorders that comes up in our coursework. Um, but I, I'm really hoping to do more with that um, at, at uh, the, at, you know, um, institution level. Thank you. Courtney. Hey, um, yeah, just I just wanted to echo what you said about um, Medicaid reimbursement, like everybody on this call should be echoing that that we, we have to at, at every, we, we do not have mental health parity in this country, still at this point in the year of our Lord 2022, we are still dealing with the same issues that we've been dealing with in the 60s 70s 80s 90s and here we are we have to continue asking for what our clients deserve and what our providers deserve and we have to keep we, we have to challenge this philosophy of you know well we've this entire field of providers has been struggling they can keep doing it we have to have a philosophy change just like we had a philosophy change with the way we view hardship with our clients we have yeah. to do that with our providers as well or we will not solve this worker shortage mm -hmm. yeah yeah i would i would um i would agree with that i i think our folks burn out uh, because they just the the door revolves so hard they could barely get the discharge summary done before they have to before people get readmitted um, it's it's a real real phenomenon all right I'm going to bounce through these slides real quick because um, I know uh, we're, we're time um, the this is a slide that talks about the re, uh, education certificate requirements to become an, a state SUDP um, you got to have 90 quarter or 60 semester credits minimum from an approved college, a minimum of 45 of those credits need to be um, in sub specific coursework. Um, that's just the education requirements. Um, experience requirements um, vary anywhere from 1000 to 2500 hours, depending on that person's education level. Uh, and that first 50 hours must be under direct supervision, which means sight and sound of an SUDP. Uh, there's also an exam, a, a national exam component, and Whatcom Community College uh, sort of teaches to the NADAC exam, uh, although we do accept ICRC. Um, there's some other eligibility requirements um, having to do with uh, their, um, their criminal background, um, and of course, as always with the Department of Health, there's a fee. Um, what we so we offer three programs: the certificate program, um, a, a an associate level program, and then we also have the alternative um, program for folks who already have a master's degree. This year, we were not able to offer it because we were not able to get enough interest in it, and so we're not going to offer that uh, fast track fifteen credit program. Um, sadly. So we'll see what next year brings uh, in, at the education level, like in, you know, in the colleges, uh, we're, we're all scrambling for enrollment. So here, how people, how do people get into it? They just apply to Wacom Community College. This is the first year um, that our programs are not select entry, which means that student, students can apply and get into the program at any quarter. So they no longer have to wait until fall quarter. Uh, which is like a, a thing that I've been working on. Um, and so this year we were able to get it done. They just need to go see an advisor, declare their area of interest and develop an education plan and then register for classes, which happens to start today for fall quarter. Um, I think this is the last thing I want to share with you. Coming soon, fall of 2023, Welcome Community College is offering a Bachelor of Applied Science in Social Work. And um, when, this is sort of a, a mid-level uh, behavioral health um, training piece that's going to fill a lot of gaps. These are, this is where you're going to get your, your quality case managers um, and quality uh, support folks who can, um, you know, sort of hit the ground running and have a, a framework in social work. And I've always told... Um, anybody that I've been training that uh, drug and alcohol counselors are kind of like baby social workers. You know, we have this environmental or ecological approach because we know our people can't stay clean and sober unless their environment is supportive of that. And if you need to get a hold of me or have further questions, um, here's my contact information. I am uh, tsandos at whatcom.edu is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. So thank you for letting me uh, Join your meeting and and um, 
anything, any, any presentations I can do in the future, I'm happy to do that. Um, because it's sort of a mission of mine as well. One other thing I want to say, and then I will I will be quiet, because uh, one of the classes that I teach um, is uh, family and addiction. And I know a lot of you have uh, encountered um, people who are really struggling with substance use disorders, and yet their family members are continuing to use, or their partners were, and it's incredibly frustrating, and it contributes to that revolving door type of thing. One of the things that we talk about in our family program is how to help family members and fr supportive friends in that um, be around people who are uh, struggling with substance use disorders because it, it because it's on a continuum. It's not always full tilt boogie. Our local agencies, uh, like all of our outpatient agencies, do not have any type of family support groups it's because these are not supported by managed care. You go to a residential center, you're going to find a family program only because in the residential center, how it works there is it's kind of an all inclusive resort. You get you, you know, you pay a daily rate and you get all of these things, but it's not so in the case of our outpatient facilities. That is a piece that's really, really missing. And it's my belief that it's family members and friends are the first level of intervention. Um, you know, research has shown us that this type of intervention um, has better outcomes than your classic. Um, HBO intervention um, techniques. So, okay, with that, I, I put my spiel in. Thank you for letting me um, come and join you. And thank you for the work that you do. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was it was it was absolutely fascinating. And you can tell you're you're sparking a lot of questions. Very briefly, uh, we we do have another presenter today. I just wanted to do a last call to see if there were any other questions for Tori before we move on, Dan. Yeah, I guess it's also a question and more of a um, uh, an action. I think that we we as a committee should be taking action to support some of the some of the system holes that uh, Tori identified. One is the unpaid or the uh, lowly paid if they're paid internships. Um, that's something that we can talk with our state representatives to yes, um, to see if we can get funding for um, those. Type, types of programs so that people can survive and they're incented to complete to go into the program complete the internship and then go into the field so that's one and then the other is um this is a federal level piece but um the medicaid reimbursement needs to be uh, at 85 percent instead of 50 percent and that needs to be ongoing and not a, not a temporary uh fix at 85 percent uh and also um Providers need support in terms of navigating the medic Medicaid system. It just um, it's challenging. It's time consuming. It's a, a low reimbursement rate that they're not incented to do. So I think those two pieces is what this committee could draft a couple of letters and shoot them out to the to our representatives. Uh, state is meeting next session uh, coming up in January, and our one of our local congressmen is uh, running for re-election uh, this fall. So I think uh, timing is good. Yeah. Arlene? Yes, um, two things. Um, regarding family uh, group therapy, there's probably nothing more powerful than group therapy for people who are attempting to heal and especially for substance abuse. Um, and so I wanted to say, when we don't have the support of these organizations and the government. We can still do group therapy at low fee. For example, if you have 10 families attending and each of them pays $15, which is a very low amount and sometimes is manageable for people, then it's enough to pay the therapists um, uh, for that program. It's worth it to do that. The other a question I wanted to ask you is that, do you use the support of 12-step programs in your teaching? Absolutely. Uh, I've been in and around the 12-step programs for 35 years. Okay. And when I was initially trained, um, they told all of us, regardless of whether or not a person was in recovery from substances, yeah. at a minimum, go to Al-Anon. Yeah, Al Anon gives an absolute, yeah. and I would encourage that for anybody working with anybody who is struggling with substance use disorders, because it really helps a person determine uh, uh, the things over which they have control and don't have control, um, and you sleep better at night. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, it's been my experience too in my life. I've known 
three or four individuals who are family members who stayed in program after 20 years of being in program because it transformed their lives and gave them back everything that they wanted out of life. So it was, uh, if you do it and you use it, it works. Mm -hmm. Jackie? Yeah, this, this is more for Dan. Dan, if, we're, if this group, these two groups are gonna write a letter to legislators, it might be, uh, I think, helpful to acknowledge what the legislators have already done, which is two infusions of money, one, a one-time amount, uh, which they received, the state received July 1st, 2022, to help support uh, workforce uh, with behavioral health agencies. And uh, the second infusion will come January 1st, 2023, and it's the 7% rate increase. Um, and, and I just, even though that's not enough, I think it's important to acknowledge the work that they've already done. Yeah, I'm all for it. I mean, diplomacy is the thing that smooths uh, feathers, and I wouldn't, um, yeah, I, I, would, I wouldn't come at it as an adversarial approach. I would, I would, I definitely would acknowledge. I don't know if we need a motion to do that, but I don't want this to, to get lost um, where we talk about it and then we don't do it. So um, I don't know if the co-chairs, um, if we can take this on with the assistance of staff or if there are, uh, if there's a volunteer or two that would like to, um, you know, do a subcommittee and, and generate a couple of letters. Chairs, would you, any, or, or committee members, any thoughts? I think it needs to be done. I agree with you, Dan. We can't keep talking about it and creating committees for committees for committees. These are issues that need to be addressed. All right. In terms so of drafting it, Dan, I think getting some uh, getting some facts in there would be really helpful too. So I, you know, I view myself as as a person who, you know, I might be able to craft some letter, but I think we need some of the details too, the specifics about rate increases. So maybe we can partner with some folks to help imbue any requests with some really good technical facts. I'll I'm not sure what the best way to do that and not go over committee, but yeah, yeah. I'll be happy to help. Stephen? I would too. Stephen? Uh yeah, I, I don't want to talk this to death either, um, but I have to say that I'm somewhat skeptical about the efficacy of a letter to legislators who we know already are, are on our side on this. I, I think Tory and others have, have accurately identified the problem as the Medicaid system and the managed care plans. And I, I think there's a more extended full court press kind of advocacy that we should be thinking about rather than one time letter that that goes to existing supporters. So I, I think some a little deeper strategizing might be valuable, but that's my two cents worth. Stephen, do you think we could, should go through the behavioral health um, uh, board of the five counties up to the health care authority? Yes, and I think the legislators can play a role in in all of that as well. But but I I think it's more of an advocacy campaign because we're talking about making some systemic changes, like Dan was talking about the fifty percent versus eighty five percent, and even even with the extra money that that Jackie acknowledged, um, you know, there needs to be more, and the systems aren't aren't doing this on their own. They're all the incentives are the other way. In the interest of time, and then we have another presentation, I'm wondering if it would satisfy those that are interested in this, if we can put this on our steering agenda at the very next meeting. I'm really cognizant of what Courtney's saying, and we don't want a good idea to go and die. But I think it, it you can tell we're not going to hash it out in the next few minutes, and I, and I want to be respectful to our next presenter. So it, does that sound amenable, Stephen? Could we maybe put this front and center on our agenda for steering to, to map out how we might respond and, and take, take this on? I'm glad to do that. And the other alternative I was thinking of was just making this uh, agenda item number one of the next uh, behavioral health uh, committee meeting. Or, or even a, a, a separate work group to try to come up with some strategy options in between meetings. Well, if we're okay to leverage the steering, I see most of the folks that are 
that are pretty excited about this are on that too, and including from both committees that only meet a couple of times a year. So if that works, then maybe we agree to do that and to do that at the next meeting and then to keep it going. Tori, I think you can see that you started us talking and we're trying to figure out how do we work together, right, with our educational institutions. I also think it really telling that one of the things that you highlighted was, you know, kind of a missing gap in terms of like youth and in families. And I think, you know, we've got a proposition coming up on the ballot. And I think there's uh, some renewed focus in our community on how do we enhance those services so there's a full suite. So I want to thank you again for your presentation and for your time. And I'll turn it over for uh, to Raylene to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Tori. I'd like to introduce you to Executive Director of the Vanessa Behan Organization out of Spokane, Amy Napton. Um, she's going to talk to us about child care in the courthouses in the criminal justice system. Um, this is something I think would assist us in possibly recidivism as well as prevention, as um, child children are victims a lot of times in cases or they have to go with their parents or parents aren't able to show up for their court hearings because they don't have child care. We also notice that a lot of jurors will say that they're unable to serve on a trial and we want jurors of, uh, equal uh, to your peers. And um, since they can't show up because they don't have child care, that it seems like having drop-in centers across the state would be beneficial for these systems. But I'm gonna let Amy Napton talk to us about the program. Um, there was a, packet, a paper in your packet in reference to this program prepared um, by the Washington State Supreme Court Gender and Justice Commission, um, prepared by the University of Washington. Amy, did you need to share any slides? I do not have any slides for you, but I do have documents if anybody wants to see them. So we'll address that if we get there. All right, well, thank you and welcome. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, let me start by saying uh, a, a little bit about who Vanessa Behan is so that you get a context of how we kind of entered this space because the children's waiting room has been around for quite a few years and we just took it over in January. So Vanessa Behan is what many people would refer to as a crisis nursery. We've been exist in existence for about 35 years. We got our start because of a little girl named Vanessa K. Behan who died of child abuse related injuries in her own home. And so we were founded as a place that would take children 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, regardless of situations and circumstances, just simply to try to help support parents when they are either at the end of their rope, they don't have resource um, support, or there's just something that's come up where their the care to their children becomes secondary. And so we operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we started primarily birth through age six um, when we first opened, but we've done some assessments and we've moved into a new facility. So we now do birth through 12. And again, the idea is just to support parents wherever they need it. So we've always been kind of an augmentation to our, to our children's waiting room here in Spokane. And I apologize, I don't remember the year that it started. It's been passed around by several different organizations. And in January, we were asked to take it over here in Spokane County. So it's been a great partnership so far. The county provides us a room in one of the buildings on our courthouse campus, and we staff it. Um, we've got furniture in there, all the equipment we need, um, and then we just are there to help serve children from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. when parents are on the courthouse campus. And so we use that term a little loosely. Um, our, our regional health district is just a block or two away, and our methadone clinic is in that building. And so families who are using um, the methadone clinic can also access the children's waiting room. We made a big push when we took over the children's waiting room to um, change the age group, our hours of operation, and then be an extension here at our, our Vanessa Behan campus. So um, we, are, we stay open through the lunch hour, which is somewhat new. Um, we take children as young as infants, which is new um, to that program. And we will extend past five o'clock if necessary. And the reason for doing all of those things is um, primarily for jurors. Uh, a lot of times they are there for an eight hour day and don't get to, to sneak out for the lunch break at the, at the same time everybody does. Um, sometimes something might run a little late. And so you just wanna make sure that we are there supporting those families and those children to the best of our ability. Um, we provide you know, everything that the parents would need there. We would provide the diapers, the wipes, the formula, the snacks that they'll eat while they're there. Um, and then, like I said, 
it's a fairly small room. So we take around eight kids at a time. We have gone a little higher than that when, when there's the demand. Um, when that feels like that space is too is getting too small, we refer people to our Vanessa Behan campus where we can um, take kids for longer. Uh, we're probably a little bit more set up for children who might be there for an entire eight hour day because we've got a place for kids to nap and can do a full kitchen. So there's meals, we have an outdoor air play area. So we will refer families in that need over to our main campus. Um, and again, it's just been a great partnership with the county. They have created a contract. They pay us to run the program and then we provide the staffing for it and all the other inc incidental things that are necessary. So um, I don't know if I should just open up to questions. I don't know, if, you know, Raylene, if you have other thoughts of things you really wanted me to highlight and focus on. So I think the one thing that you had mentioned before is it wasn't just for um, jurors and it wasn't just for people that were going to court, but there was other alternatives. Um, I'd like to see if you wanted to expand on that a little bit more. Yeah, um, I, I absolutely. Did something about um, if they had to meet with their domestic violence counselor or attorneys. Anything going on in that courthouse campus. So if they're meeting with their attorneys on campus, if they've got a court hearing, if they're simply dropping off paperwork um, and don't want to have their children in tow, anything that's going to happen on our courthouse campus or can be arranged on our courthouse campus or within a couple of blocks of that, um, we will take the kiddos for that reason. I, I think it's super, it's a very easy progression for us because that's much, very much what we do at the Vanessa Behan main campus. So for us to be a little bit more flexible in that, it just comes to by our nature. Um, I will say we, um, at Vanessa Behan, our main campus, we are licensed by the, by DCYF in our state at the campus because the parents are technically on site, you, we don't have to be licensed. And so he, we have not sought out a license for that space. I'll be candid, I would say we probably would have a few hurdles to, to jump through to be licensed because of the way the state, um, the requirements that are put in there. Um, this room um, does not have running water in it. We have access to bathrooms just out of the hallway. Um, so that's you know some of the challenges we face just by the room that we were given on the courthouse campus. So I think there's room for improvement, but I think we have done a really good job of working within what we have to work with and making it work. And I think that's just been the nature of what we do at Vanessa Vihan is truly just find another way. Um, we put the children at the center of every decision we make. And so even on the courthouse campus, if a parent comes and says something, you know, something different than what you would, ex <laughs> seems like the norm of what would happen at a county courthouse, we know those kids are gonna be better in our care than wandering around the courthouse campus with their parents. And so we just wanna make sure that we're providing that safety and that support to the parents so that they can really focus on whatever brought them to our um, courthouse. So it, yeah, it could be a jury, it could be a trial, it could be um, visiting somebody in, our, in the jail system. Um, again, anywhere we can take those kiddos to help lessen the stress on them um, and their parents. You know, everything we know about brain development and adverse childhood experiences and hope theories and things like that, we know that we can build resiliency when we can pull children out of these situations and really focus on their needs. And that of course then supports the families and makes it less stressful for them. And when they pick up their children, they're in a better place for caring for their kiddos. It also gives us that opportunity to talk with parents about um, choices that we make and where maybe children would be better um, and why we wouldn't want to take them to a courthouse campus, um, different things we, that children don't need to be exposed to and just letting them be kids. Thank you, Amy. Do we have uh, questions? Mike. I got lots, but I'm gonna go just very gently and we'll see what other ones come up. I suppose if a community was looking to have something like Vanessa Behan Center, which is amazing, and I did spend a little bit of time on your website, and I know you're really kind of talking about the the the, um, the non-licensed facility that supports courts, because that's obviously near and dear to our heart. But I think more broadly speaking, if the community was interested in that, could you speak a little bit to, I mean, I know a little bit about the origin story, which is both compelling mm -hmm. and and really hard to hear, but um, it, what advice would you give or you know, have you had people come to you and said, hey, we'd like to blueprint certain things that you do. How might we model yeah. that? What would be steps to take? Yeah, the place I would first start, and actually because you're in Washington, it makes it pretty easy. Um, you start with your licensing agency and find out how they would license you and 
um, what, what you would need to set up. So that's why I would always start. In Washington, we fall under a group care license. And then underneath that, there's a section called emergency respite centers. And that's what we're licensed as, is an emergency respite center. And that dictates staffing ratios, square footage, um, bathrooms, uh, all the things that you would have to take into account so you can start to put together kind of a budget of, of what would be required to open a facility like what we're doing. I will be really candid and say, yes, we have helped people in, in many different states um, try to open things. There is a group in Washington right now that is looking at how can we um, increase the amount of support systems and respite centers in different areas, different ways, um, and kind of um, replicate some of the services that are already happening in our in our in our state and really just exemplify and and um, grow the programs that are happening I, again I, I keep going back to trying to help people understand that we would have less domestic violence we'd have less homelessness we'd have less um, substance misuse if we got it right from the get-go with our kids and that's really where we want to focus about again taking the children at the center of that knowing that we can um, give them what we call that North Star experience, they will seek that the rest of their lives and will hopefully, um, and we can see this through his, through um, research and through our own experiences, that that trajectory changes. They make better choices. They don't find themselves in the same situations. They have more hope and they wind up doing much better than, than the environment they were in. It's all about changing those generational cycles, right? Um, so yeah, we would be more than happy to help support anything that you were doing um, in any way we possibly can. Thank you. Courtney? Um, I just wanted to offer, I, I used to work in Spokane and I'm familiar with your agency and I, I wish we had something like that here. I can't tell you how many of my clients shared with me that you, you guys truly changed their, their day and their lives and it was very helpful. Um, and it helps some, I mean, the courts, at least from my position, I know not everybody on this call is, is immersed in that world, but I mean, our, our criminal legal system, it, it truly asks our clients to, in the moment, decide if you want to be a parent or decide if you want to resolve this sometimes, because sometimes there's not childcare provided or a situation where they can just, you know, drop everything and address that task. And this helps provide where that gap is. Um, among other gaps. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a lot of things wrong in our systems, don't we, as far as asking parents to get a job and to do all these things, but then not to provide childcare for them. Right, exactly. Yeah, we, we, we set a lot of people up for failure where, you know, that failure is not really on their part. It's on the systems. And exactly. as, as entities in those systems, we have to recognize where we have power to to use discretion to make things a little bit easier for folks that are all, already vulnerable. We don't have to make things harder for them. Exactly. Thank you, Mike. All right, I get to ask a second question. I waited a little bit. So I know you have another, um, you have a, a family treatment program that's in your area, if I'm not mistaken. And, and somebody help me with the name. I wanna say Rising. Rising Sun. Strong. Rising Strong. Could you speak to any connections, formal or informal, and how programs like yours might work with uh, in partner in tandem or not uh, with, with programs such as? Oh, I wish I would have had this question asked ahead of time so I could have done a little more research. Um, I have not been as immersed in what Rising Strong has been doing. I, I hear amazing things about them. The idea at Rising Strong is that parents who are dealing with substance misuse get to keep their children and work through their treatment plan at Rising Strong, which I believe is through Catholic Charities here in town. Um, they provide, I, they were trying to provide some on-site childcare, and I don't know if that ever came to fruition. I do know we still serve families from there for a lot of different reasons. Um, sometimes that just becomes a trust issue where parents know us and are comfortable with us. Um, sometimes that might become the fact that we're 24 seven, seven days a week. We don't close on holidays or weekends or anything like that. So there might be some reasons for that as well. But yeah, Rising Strong has got a great reputation in our community. For our local providers, whose uh, executive director, um, Byron Mannering, was, a, um, was on our behavioral health subcommittee, um, really kind of led us through our process to see, you know, one, might this committee task force get behind, right, such an effort. It became difficult at, at best to try to get a provider who might stand up mm -hmm. such a program. But obviously, as you heard from Ms. Sandoz earlier, right, we, we, we just, there, there are a couple of these just screaming gaps. 
and mm -hmm. I think for families and your organization, obviously providing a really important niche one, um, and also kind of this other one. I was just kind of curious. So it sounds like there is definitely, if, if, at the very minimum, some some good informal connections. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Amy, I think trying to um, develop something like this in Whatcom County would be more ideal for the Bellingham area next to the Whatcom County Jail um, and Bellingham Municipal Court, which is open on a regular basis. Uh, but the small cities um, where we have one day a week or one trial a year, maybe two, um, is the licensing for drop-in centers something that can be done with an existing daycare in the area? I would think absolutely that is something you can do. We're not licensed as a child care center, so it's a, it would be a little bit, I don't know all the ins and outs of that, but I've heard of a lot of people doing respite care through a voucher system with child care centers. So a parent would call an organization, say, I need child care this time these days. They would get referred to a child care agency locally where those children can go. I think the challenge of that right now is that there's so few childcare, at least we're experiencing this in Spokane. I don't know about everywhere else, but there's just such a lack of, of availability in childcare centers, especially nights and weekends and, and the after hours. And so that's where we, at our Vanessa Behan, we pick up a lot of those pieces. Um, I would say, so that's one option. The other thing is I believe when our children's waiting room first started, and I believe King County has a similar program that uses volunteers. Um, to run their program. So that's another option. If you have somebody who could manage a group of volunteers that would do that, especially if you're talking it's one day a week, that might be more realistic to figure out how to um, create something like that. Thank you, Amy. Is there any, any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna see if I can get Jake Weebush. I saw him. I have a question for you, Jake, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. So, Jake, um, I see child care needs from the court's perspective in, in court. Um, what do you see for the needs for people coming to probation appointments and the needs for child care there? I mean, certainly it could be used. Uh, we don't turn them away. I mean, often they, they can join. It's not the most, you know, obviously not the greatest setting for kids to come, but they're, they, they do come. Um, it's probably a little less intimidating than um, coming into court uh, for sure. But I, I, I could see a need there, yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for Amy? All right, the risk of my third, so thank <laughs> you. I'm, I'm really curious, you know, part of it would like, how might we lift it? And I think you really pointed to like some of the, the governing statutes, right, that might govern such a thing. But the other thing is kind of the secret sauce, which which is kind of your funding and your, your website talks a little bit about that. You don't have to go into specifics, but maybe very broadly, it seems like you all are very uh, effectively braiding. Um, numerous different ones. Could you maybe highlight those ones that you think are the most critical or instrumental for you in your work and what you do? I think we're very unique in the fact that we're privately funded. So the only um, government funding we have is through our children's waiting room contract with the county. Otherwise, everything we do here at Vanessa Behan is privately funded. Um, and I would say probably the best way that we do that is through individual connections. Um, people who have a heart for what we do. We do events, we do um, a lot of mailings and things like that, but really the best thing is one-on-one, -on -one. come see what we're doing, see the impact, and we invite people to be a part of that. Um, we operate about right now, so our building is new. We are licensed for up to 60 kids financially because of being privately funded. We're about half that, we're about a little less than 30 kiddos that we're caring for at a time. That equates to about 6,000 visits every single year because we're counting every time a child walks in the door. Um, so again, yeah, our funding is, is one of those challenges that we, we are constantly looking at. Um, but I would say, you know, there probably is plenty of opportunity for some governmental funding. Our philosophy has just always been, if we're going to be successful, it's going to be because this community wraps around us and makes it happen. And it's been successful. We have supporters who support us simply because of that. So our funding model has worked for us. I don't know that it necessarily does for everybody. We have a very compelling story, as you've heard. Um, when you tell the story of Vanessa Behan and the fact that our goal is the prevention of that, uh, people tend to get on board. 
So that's really incredibly helpful. I do want to just circle back, just having come into the conversation and not knowing all the things we were talking about, but we just went through um, a huge increase in wages for our staff. Um, they're not required to have much more than a year's worth of experience of childcare. Uh, but the reality is that the trauma that they're working with, the expectations we have of them, the heart that they bring to it, we need to pay them. And there is nowhere out there that will give you a comparable wage for what somebody working in the childcare industry should make that is less than poverty wages. And so we looked at the United Way Alice information for Spokane County, and that was incredibly helpful for us to say, we need to set a bar differently than what the world might define for people working in this industry. And so we took the stability wage and said, nobody on our, nobody on our staff will make less than a st stable wage based on United Way's Alice reports. And that has really helped us um, hire and retain our staff. Now we're only, we've only started in, since July, but we had, I don't know, 15, 20 open shifts and we have four that are pending filled right now, and then we will be fully staffed. So it's been an incredible journey for us to, um, as we say, put our children first, we also add our staff in there too, so. Thank you, Amy. Let's see, and then Courtney. Thank you, Amy. I just wanted to say I really appreciate the program that you're providing today. I uh, want to say that I agree with so many things that you're talking about. Uh, I also want to let you know and everyone here know that our community is working on a flexible funding program right now that would uh, help in situations like this. And I really believe that our community needs these kinds of things that you're talking about. You know, I, I work for the court system. You don't know me, I'm the Whatcom County prosecutor. And I, I know that we need uh, help with childcare in our courts and, and so many other things. Because, you know, when we have kids that are supported, our community will be, be better in the long run. So that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Eric. Courtney? Uh, you know, I completely forgot my question for you, but thank you, Amy. Just wanted to say um, thank you again for your work and just providing that holistic lens because we need it. And, you know, kids need their parents and and we, we have to support everybody in the family. Yeah, I love that because it is all about keeping those kids and parents together. We know they're going to be better off in their home of origin if we can just give that support to the parents to be as successful. Every parent loves their child. We just need to come alongside them and help them fill in the gaps where there's holes. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And we started as a very small organization in a little tiny two-story house 35 years ago and have just continued to grow. So, it, you know, it's just a matter of starting somewhere. And it's, it, you know, I think the children's waiting room is a prime example of that. It's a tiny little room in a building and that's where we started and we hope to continue to grow it. I just remembered my question, um, but I'm, I'm so glad that you're growing. I just, I also want to do acknowledge, thank you for acknowledging what you said about the wage. Um, I just want to echo that for that, that, that awareness that you have. I mean, that, that truly is what makes the difference. It sounds like you're close to being fully staffed. Yeah, absolutely. And people show up differently. There was a, I, I think that there's just so much that goes into that, that we can't ask our staff to work in the same, live in the same circumstances that our families are um, and expect them to come to work any differently than our parents show up stressed. And so we've got to take care of them because they'll take care of our parents and our children. Yep, yep, we got to take care of each other. Thank yep. you. I'll stay off my soapbox. Oh, thank you, Amy. We really appreciate your soapbox. It's a valuable tool. We don't want people to um, continue to commit crimes or to miss court because they don't have the child care. Um, we also know that children are sponges and absorb so much, and we don't need to have them seeing the trauma that sometimes occurs in criminal courts as well as civil courts, um, family law situations, methadone treatment, talking to their attorneys. There's so many different aspects that you guys are helping in Spokane. Would love to see something like that here in Whatcom County. So anything our committees can do to um, try to assist in doing something like this uh, would be appreciated. Amy, we may be reaching out for more assistance in the future. Um, Please do. I, I definitely want to thank you for your time and joining us today. It's beneficial. Is there any more questions for Amy? All right. I would just say it's super easy to get a hold of me. It's amy, A-M-Y, at vanessabehan.org. Um, I'm happy to help in any way I possibly can. I think this work is so important. And if we can get it right for our kids, it'll trickle up and we'll be in a better, better position in the long run.
So thanks for having me, you guys. Thank you. Okay. Bye. I think we're down to other business. Is there anything else, Mike or Arlene or Dan? I don't, um, Brian Estes. Yeah, this is, uh, I guess, for Mike and Dan. I'm wondering at some point, can we have a discussion of how the LEAD program and GRACE program are being evaluated, especially from an outcome basis. I think, we, do we still have somebody from the health department? I think we have Jackie Mitchell here. You know, currently, right, those are under the, the Whatcom County Health Department. And I wonder if we, and we have from time to time invited Brian, um, grace and lead supervisors to speak to their program and, and some of the outcomes. But maybe Jackie, if you wouldn't mind to Brian's question, what might that look like? Is there some report that we might be able to share with the committee or what's your suggestion there? Well, I'm actually, Mike, I'm going to defer to Perry because I see that he's on. Oh, my bad. I did not see that Perry was on the call. Yeah. Hi, Perry. Hi, thanks. Uh, so um, certainly, Brian, can you elaborate just a little bit more, uh, just so that I make sure that um, I'm, I'm getting to what you're asking about? Well, I'm just wondering, what is the evaluation strategy? And where are we with implementing it? You know, LEAD's been around for decades. Um, and I just wondered how, especially not so much, you know, we can count a bunch of stuff. But what does it mean over time in terms of outcomes? Are we tracking that particular aspect? Because I think that really is more at the key of effectiveness. Um, and that's my primary interest is, you know, rather than client scene. And I mean, that, that's all really important, some of those metrics, but they're, but they're output, not outcome. And so I, I just wondered, what's the lens for evaluating both those programs over time from an outcome perspective. So that's um, really helpful, Brian. And yes, I think that we uh, absolutely, there are uh, uh, metrics that are being measured with both the LEAD and the GRACE program. Um, and I can speak with uh, Melora Christensen as the manager of the Response Systems Division, which um, encompasses the GRACE and LEAD programs as well as other programs. And so I can talk with her about uh, uh, attending, if that's appropriate, in terms of maybe the behavioral health uh, um, uh, subcommittee, and you know, bring some specific and updated information to that. There are also some websites that I can send out. I don't have it right in front of me uh, that speak a, a bit to it. But again, in terms of, we'd love to talk more about um, metrics and uh, outcome for the Grace and Lead program. Be happy to do that. And, and this might be above and beyond perhaps what's required, for example, for the grant for LEAD. Mm -hmm. Understood, yes. Yeah, um, okay. Thank you, that, that's helpful. I will take on that responsibility and uh, communicate with uh, Dan Hamill and, and Mike Parker just as the chairs to, uh, to that for uh, the next meeting. We could definitely include Brian and Perry, something like that, even if it's even if we have a clogged agenda, we could certainly have a piece on that. It's been very helpful, I think, for members in the past to get periodic updates. And I want to say it's almost a couple times a year, maybe Stephen remembers, but not infrequently. It really informs the work. What's going well? What are challenges? Um, I think it's very, very helpful. Thanks for that question. And um, for sure, we'll take it on. Thank you. Mike Kelly. Yeah, oh. thanks. I, I just would add, Brian, uh, just from a, a GRACE program in a particular, uh, probably in another month and a half or so, you'll see some uh, dashboards that will be put up uh, representing GRACE and, and as well as EMS uh, that you'll be able to get a snapshot of what was going on. Uh, for GRACE in particular, yes, uh, we are tracking those outcomes and, and what are happened to those page, uh, clients that, uh, from enrollment to uh, uh, graduation, if you will. Uh, but even tracking further. So you, you should have some more transparent information that you'll be able to log on to the county website, uh, look on it. Uh, project completion is, like I said, a couple months out, but we're really close and you'll be able to see some of that. And Melora is, is a great person to represent all that, of course. Heather, I see your hand up. Um, 
I'm really excited, Mike, to hear about the dashboard. And that was two things I wanted to say in the design of the local lead program. I know that there was a lot of emphasis on the front end of how will we evaluate success? And in particular, how do we build an equity, a focus on equity and outcomes around equity? Um, the second thing I wanna say is that is such a dream of mine and I think ours to have a community dashboard focused on public health and safety that would have meaningful data about the jail, who's in it and why, in addition to these outcomes and even just summary numbers. And I know that Lead and Grace are doing tremendous work around um, that communication. Um, so thank you. And then Brian, I just wanted to say, I think Lead started in maybe 2014 or 15. Um, and the U university in Seattle and the University of Washington did a really amazing evaluation um, a year or two after the program started to show the difference it makes kind of broadly. Um, so, but I think we need to do local evaluation too. So thank you. I would just add that I think Brian's question underscores why we're engaging with a public relations firm too to talk about some of the things because I think that question is very real and if we have it imagine our community members have it so we definitely Brian I think your point is really good and it helps us kind of keep to that and just realizing that we need accessible ways for people to kind of grade how we're doing with some of our um, with some of the efforts that we've we've undertaken and I'm excited about what will come out um, or public relations to be able to, to talk about some of the wins. Obviously, some of them are beset with challenges too, but there's there's been progress made. And, and I think you've highlighted an area where we've actually done some good work and probably has more to do. I think communicating with the public about cost avoidance is always a challenge, but many of these issues lend themselves to that if you can communicate to the public in an effective way. We have a few minutes and co-chairs, I wondered if we might take a few minutes if people wanted to entertain it to go back to um, Council Member Hamill's suggestion after Tori Sandos' um, presentation about some advocacy efforts that the committee might take on. And, and I want to propose that if this is not the right venue for it, I just saw we had some time on the calendar. So I'd, I'd offer that. And if, there's, if, if this is an appropriate place, co-chairs, um, what do you think? I some examples of what you mean. I'm, I'm sorry, Arlene. Uh, can you give a couple of examples of what you're talking about? Oh, I, I was talking about bringing back up what Council Member Hamill brought up in terms of maybe writing a letter of advocacy, talking about either reimbursement rates or provider rates to the healthcare authority or any folks in charge of those those rates here in the state of Washington, if we wanted to bring that conversation back up. Dan? Uh, yeah, so I think I just was thinking about what Stephen had said, and, and I agree, simply writing a letter is you know, probably not gonna be enough. I think it needs, I think we need to make our voices heard for sure. Um, but I do think um, it's all about relationships and perhaps uh, inviting key stakeholder decision makers to this forum um, to talk about these issues, maybe an additional way to, um, beyond having our voices heard, um, perhaps uh, taking some action, because that's what it's really about. We can't just, we can't just advocate. We've got to make sure that I mean, this is real world stuff where these, the, the STDPs, um, when they're interning, they're not making money, they're, they're not able to pay their bills, they're dependent on a partner or roommates or whatever the situation is, and that's, that's just not fair. And it's not right, and we need we need the folks to um, to be out there and active. And then, as far as reimbursements go, uh, that's a that's a, a federal discussion with Medicaid. And I was I was just thinking I had a conversation with Congressman Rick Larson um, probably five months ago uh, regarding that. And you know he made, he made it sound like it was it would be like moving mountains to get that done. And I realized that that's a harder thing to ask for. But um, I'm just looking for ways to make things um just better for people and you know this is such a behavioral health is at the at, it's not it's like housing it's at the intersection of a lot of things that we talk about 
So I just, that's where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm in favor of doing whatever is most effective, obviously. So that's, that's where I'm at. Stephen and then Courtney. Um, I, I agree with Dan that I think conversation might be the, the beginning step of this. And I'd be all in favor of inviting uh, representative rule. I mean, this is, this is her professional uh, um, expertise and, and she's been very effective at, at uh, making improvements in behavioral health uh, services and funding. I, I'd like to include her and maybe as Arlene suggested, Joe Valentine from the uh, North Sound uh, ASO to strategize how, how can we move the healthcare authority, which doesn't seem all that interested in butting heads with the managed care plans on, on enforcing their contracts or, or mental health parity, uh, as, as Courtney was indicating earlier. But, but those are the people who know where the levers are um, and, and might be able to, to form alliances within the legislature. Because I, I think this is really a state level problem um, with, with the state Medicaid program. It, it's a joint state federal program. And I don't think the answers are on the federal level. But, it, but if we can find some, some leverage points uh, in the state system with the managed care plans, with the healthcare authority, and I think Joe and Alicia would be pretty valuable people to have that conversation with. Whenever anybody tells us that it's impossible, you do this. Um, you're not to give up. You're to press forward and persist. Um, however many years it takes us, it will, it will happen. Yeah. yeah, to echo what Arlene just said, we, yeah, we have to keep pressing forward. We have to circle back to the root issue. It's very easy for all of us in our work to be sidetracked by things that might be more surface level. But what we're talking about right now is, is root issues to systemic problems. And I think that the comment that Stephen made about Alicia Rule, that that's what I was going to suggest is we should reach out to her because she's an LICSW. She understands this more than any other representative that we currently have right now is going to understand it. And the system's complex. I mean, I, I can't tell you how often I'm blue in the face trying to explain just basic components of the behavioral health care system to parts of the legal world. It, our, our systems are so complex and so compartmentalized. And we are truly working with the, the most vulnerable members of our community who have so many barriers in place that this is the root issue that we need to address and are one of many. And I think we can do that if we keep circling back to it. I hope Alicia can help as well. Um, Cause really it's, the, the, it's a statewide issue. It's a countrywide issue. We cannot itemize healing. We cannot itemize mental health or substance use or recovery or resiliency, we cannot itemize this on a Medicaid billing statement. It is too complex to manage the way that we have managed it in the past and it has to change or these problems will persist. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah, sorry, I didn't hear what was said before Stephen spoke, but uh, I did like what Stephen said. Uh, I think it's a great idea to invite both Alicia because of her personal professional experience and uh, Joe Valentine has a superb lay of the land I think around these issues so he would be a great asset as well so I don't know if we're talking about having a uh, behavioral health committee meeting where these people attend because I think both of them together could probably help us understand what if any concrete steps we could take to uh, to promote uh, uh, workforce improvements, uh, wage improvements for the workforce. So um, really, really like the idea of getting some information from the two of them. Thank you. I, I think it would be helpful at maybe the next steering committee that we could come up with some type of outline, what exists, what um, needs, and then invite them to either the next joint meeting or even the task force meeting and give them kind of an outline so that they have a little bit of preparation beforehand. I don't know, what are your thoughts, Stephen? Um, yeah, I, I think some, some 
rethinking uh, would, would be valuable, some framing of the issues that we want to focus on. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I also think this, this is, as a couple people have said, this is really a core issue that this, these committees uh, keep running up against that, that a lot of our reform focus keeps getting stymied by. Um, so I, I think taking it to the task force and, and, and getting some formal authority, I, I don't know. I don't know if these full committee meetings are the place to do some of this work. This, uh, on some level, this sounds like sort of a, a, a backroom work group kind of thing to, to really get some traction on some of this. Uh, might be more appropriate, but you know, what, I'd welcome if, other people's reactions. Oh, I, I was just thinking, I wonder what if we had the, what if the behavioral health subcommittee held a, an interim meeting? Because it seems to me like that's the, the best place to address these issues. It's very much behavioral health that we're talking about. And, um, and and it is a, supposed to be a working committee. So I know, Dan, you don't have a lot of spare time on your hands. And so, but I just wondered if we could have a more, you know, a sooner meeting than the next one. I'm not sure when the next meeting is scheduled for, so. Mike, and. Oh. I was just going to suggest, I love the targeting of one of our 42nd reps based on her background, Alicia Rule. I would just also mention that when we had a broader catchment with 40th and 42nd folks about the Blake decision, I thought it was instructive for the task force. I thought it was instructive for, for our legislators to get exposed. And I would just underscore that, you know, um, Representative Shoemake um, was strongly supportive of a workforce uh, proviso. So maybe casting that slightly larger than just Alicia Rule, maybe looking at 40th and 42nd reps to invite to such a meeting. I, for one, and I'm going to turn this over to Dan, just get his thoughts. I, for one, would be happy to host such a conversation. It is something that Behavioral Subcommittee has talked about multiple times. It was actually one of the key tenants in a letter that Heather Flaherty helped our committee write um, uh, to the exact office, and we believe it's a really critical, um, just a, it's a, one of the most critical issues we run into. I agree that um, Sharon should be in included. And um, I also would like us to be able to ask them, the three of them, what they need from us, um, what, how we can participate, how we can support whatever steps they think they are capable of doing. But um, because we don't know that, and they, we don't know the answer to that. So, um, Hey, y'all, I've, I've got to hop off. I've got another meeting here in two minutes and I got to, um, anyway, this is great. Tell me where I need to be and I'll be there. Yeah. Thanks, Steven. Dan. Steven? Um, I think my focus on Alicia and Joe uh, was seeing a two-step process. One was targeting, uh, strategizing, sort of eliminating non-starter ideas and focusing in on things that were practical and effective. I, I think their expertise is, is what's valuable there. Sharon definitely would be on board if we told her what we needed. Yeah. I'm talking about a, 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 a step that decides what we need to tell other people and, and form, a, form an action team. So uh, I would not start with inviting everybody to that discussion, I'd start with people who uh, know what's what and can can uh, set some priorities or some uh, make some effective choices. I and I, I I also have to drop off, so I'm sorry, folks. Well, I think we're at, at one o'clock, um, so I think we can uh, address this. Actually, I see Courtney still has her hand up, so I want to go back to you, Courtney. I just real quick, because I know Stephen's jumping off. I, I agree with the the strategy that Stephen outlined, just because we, we've seen this happen before. All of us who have done these big meetings, it's very easy for narratives to get switched and changed with multiple people in meetings. We want to we, we we probably want to focus that narrative before we open up the circus tent. Duly noted. Thank you. Um, so I didn't see any other business because we jumped back to this topic, which was excellent. 
Um, I think we have to open this up to public comment. Thank you. It doesn't look like we have anyone attending in our council conference room. If any of the remote attendees would like to speak, please virtually raise your hand now. And no hands are raised. Thank you. Um, Mike, Arlene, do we have anything else? Or are we ready to adjourn? Cool. All, right. All right. I think we can officially adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everybody, for your participation.